So thanks for being here and joining us for this really, really special event. Glass Houses by Design Legends, Miss Vandero, Philip Johnson, and Paul Woodruff. No other American house of the mid-century years had come to capture the fantasy of living in transparent glass as the three iconic houses which will be celebrated here this evening. The Farnsworth House, the Glass House, and the Walker Guest House. Constructed within two years of each other, between 1949 and 1951, and designed by design legends, these are among the most admired, influential, and memorable homes of the 20th century. Each marked extraordinary moments in the careers and legacies of their respective architects, Miss Van der Rohe, Philip Johnson, and Paul Rudolph. They created these masterpieces of modernism in very different moments in their careers. By the time he completed the Farnsworth House, Miss was 65 years old and was hailed as the world's most famous architect. It ultimately became the symbol of his commitment to excellence, to simplification, to the art of the building, a full representation of his famous motto, less is more. When Philip Johnson moved to his glass house, he was 43, already instrumental as a curator at MoMA. He had just completed a modernist house for Dominique and Jean de Menil in Houston and was in the process of establishing his architecture office. Paul Rudolph was a young architect in his 30s and a recent graduate from Harvard Graduate School of Design, just establishing his practice in Sarasota, Florida, when he designed a small guest house for his client, Walter Walker, a doctor from a wealthy Minnesota family. The three glass houses were, were built in locations that couldn't have been more different from one another. The Farnsworth House in a countryside in Illinois along the Fox River. Philip Johnson's Glass House in a wealthy community in Connecticut surrounded by a New England lush landscape. And the Walker House on an isolated island off the west coast of Florida facing the Gulf of Mexico. The Farnsworth House was the first, the touchstone the source of inspiration for the other two and for other endless houses built since. Yet, Mies began envisioning his futuristic glass buildings decades earlier when living in Germany and when coining the term skin and bone architecture. As a young architect, he was a part of a group of German visionaries who believed that glass was an agent of change, power, and freedom. They sought to create architecture of fantasy and spiritual mystery, transparency, light, and shimmering reflections. Glass towers, they believed, would replace the cathedral as serving the new communal society, in the words of Walter Gropius, founder of the Bauhaus, a cathedral of socialism. This evening's discussion will illuminate the combined history and fascinating narratives of three American glass houses of the mid-century years, which have become myths. So I would like to introduce the panel, Hilary Lewis, chief curator and creative director of the Glass House, she is co-author of books and numerous articles on Philip Johnson and for many years worked directly with him. Thank you, Hillary. Carl Abbott, FAIA. <clears throat> Carl is one of the most awarded architects in Florida and the Caribbean 
region, a graduate from Yale. He studied in the legendary Paul Rudolph's master class of 1961 to 1962. He was a member of the original Sarasota School of Architecture, which we are going to discuss here. And he's an expert on Paul Rudolph. Thank you, Carl. Skol Mahaffey. Executive Director of the Farnsworth House. He's a landscape architect, cultural landscape historian, and adjacent professor of architecture at the IIT College of Architecture. I would like to start with asking each one of you, what makes those glass houses masterpieces of architecture? One of the significant things about the Farnsworth House compared to other uh, Mies structures is that he was both architect and general contractor. So he could really oversee the details. And in fact, some of the details were worked out on site that would come to characterize the rest of his American career. I think in terms of historical significance, um, the fact that um, he was really in a slump in the early 40s, other than IIT, all of his American projects, the clients just declined to build to go ahead. So Edith was really, uh, gave him the opportunity to sort of redeem his career and redeem himself. Hillary, the glass house. Oh, the glass house is unquestionably a very significant structure, not only in terms of Johnson's history, but also in the history of American architecture and modern architecture overall. Uh, there's no question it relates very strongly to the Farnsworth House. I'm sure we'll be talking a bit more about that uh, as we continue the conversation. Uh, but for Johnson, it represented the ability to uh, uh, create something that is based on an ideal, the ideal of living uh, within glass walls, as all of these houses uh, attempted, but also to integrate uh, living with nature, which is something that I think that uh, for many uh, people, they don't fully understand until they visit our property. How many people here have been to the glass house? Just. That's great. Okay. Please come back. How many people have been to the Farnsworth House? Wow. Okay. Good. So, Carl, I want to ask you about Paul Rudolph's Walker Guest House. I visited the Walker Guest House in the mid 50s. It was about three or four years old when I first went there. I think the Walker family, a number of them here, your parents, your grandparents, <laughs> maybe. But it was a building, I was in high school. and. I look at a masterpiece by my own personal feelings. And number one is, is a building that, or a structure or a piece of art or sculpture, and it makes you feel breathtaking. It, your breath is taken away. It's almost like you're in awe. And that's the sense I had of the Walker Guest House when I went there. I couldn't believe it. It's so simple. It was done before there was a bridge to Sanibel Island. Sanibel is just south of, oh, excuse me, out in the Gulf of Fort Myers. And there was only boat to take equipment. It was all based on, on a four by eight piece of, piece of plywood module. Only two people occupied the Farnsworth House before it became a museum. How livable is it? <laughs> That's a question we often get. Um, so interestingly, this was a weekend house. So no one's really ever lived in the Farnsworth House. Um, Edith Farnsworth lived in Chicago. She used the property on weekends. As she moved into retirement in the 1960s, she was there more frequently. She was there in the middle of the week. Um, Peter Palumbo lived in Plano, the nearby town. He had a Victorian house he restored. He used the house as an entertainment pavilion. And, um, and as a museum. Very quickly after she moved to the Farnsworth House, she started talking about her problems living there. The place where really took her problems and promoted them was the House Beautiful magazine. And uh, there was a special issue was called The Threat to the Next America. And Elizabeth Gordon, the legendary editor of House Beautiful, this is what she wrote. First of all, she said, something is rotten in the state of design, and it is spoiling some of our best efforts in modern living. Then she takes Edith Farnsworth, and she interviewed her, and this is what she said. She said, do I feel calm? The truth is that this house, with its four walls of glass, I feel like a prowling animal always on the alert. 
I'm always restless. I'm just listening to this and realizing that I think for many people, they would feel exactly like that. And it couldn't be more different in terms of the experience of Philip Johnson living in a house surrounded by glass walls, where he felt absolutely calm and delighted to be in that space. And it certainly wouldn't have made sense for, for many people in terms of their design ethos, but for someone who liked absolute precision, as well as this very careful integration of the built world with the natural world, Johnson was very pleased to spend many dec decades, from 49 until the time he died in 2005, living in the glass house. So, so it's not for everyone. And I just no. want to show you a picture. This is the photo in House Beautiful. I mean, she looks so miserable. <laughs> so Rudolf was really brought a brilliant solution to live in a glass house. Exactly solution for exactly those problems by adding these compartments. Does this make the Walker house more livable? Well, I, I, I heard the Walker, part of, one of the ladies of the Walker house speak about it, questioning it first, and then she said she got to love it. So I don't know the way of living it there. So it's not, I can't really answer that, that, that question directly, but it is a building that the walls flip down. And so you can make the walls totally private. You don't draw your curtain, you drop the wall. So it's can I ask the Walker or, or family? Others. For me, living in this space has been a, really a sacred experience. And I would say that um, what you had said in the beginning, that it takes your breath away because you become part of nature. It doesn't, uh, you know, you don't insert yourself into nature. It sort of puts its arms around you. And the other thing, that I want to say is it's sort of participatory architecture, which this thing about lifting the flaps up and down, it's so much fun to do that. His glass house is his most well-known house. Yeah. Probably his best. But uh, it really started when he curated a show at MoMA in 1947 and Mies mm -hmm. presented the model of the Farnsworth house. Yep. Philip Johnson admitted that this was the source of inspiration. How do you address that aspect in the narrative of the glass house? Oh, sure. I mean, Johnson was never shy about uh, discussing his sources. Uh, very different than uh, the approach that many architects uh, in modernism uh, would have uh, followed. He did not uh, lie to Mies, like do it just behind his back. Uh, but what he did do uh, was not necessarily pleasing to Mies van der Rohe because, not just because he copied him, because he didn't copy him enough. The glass house is quite different from both of these structures in the same way, or actually in a different way, but in a similar vein as you discussed, Carl, that this, this uh, bringing together of the Frank Lloyd Wright American nature of, of architecture, Johnson, in a weird way, did that as well. Scott, I want to talk to you about Edith Farnsworth. So we know that she wasn't very happy with the house, and she had a whole different way of thinking how she's going to furnish her house, which was totally different than what, than what Mies envisioned. And this is how it looked like. And I know that next year you plan an exhibition that will dress the Farnsworth house the same way she lived in. Right, right. Why is it important? Well, so um, she told me very early on that she didn't want his furniture. And as a project started to go over budget, of course, that was one place that she drew the line. She writes in her journal that she told me that furniture to her was like a second skin and she needed it to be comfortable for her. Mies was constantly searching for the absolute, for the timeless and he uh, devised a very specific formula for that. Today, when we look at Mises houses, Farnsworth house, it has a great revival. And you can see so many houses built this way today all over the world. It wasn't always perceived timeless. I know you went to Yale yep. in the early 60s. You went, uh, you studied with Vincent Scully and he was the first one to really, or maybe famously, to question modernism. Uh, he really made 
the Mies formula, not that timeless during the 60s, 70s, and particularly 80s. So my question to you is how timeless is it? I think you have to stand back and sometimes, there's this comment I've heard often, we don't like what our parents like, we like what our grandparents liked. So I think that really applies to a lot of art and architecture. And let me, let me tie this back to what you asked about Vincent Scully. We all had a really close relationship with Scully, I felt. And in those days, Scully was totally a purist, a purist modernist. About 10 years after you, this was in 62, Vincent Scully, Venturi, and a whole group of Charles Moore and a lot of the others started pushing a whole other direction. And Scully went with it heavy. And Scully was one of the strongest voices who's ever been in architectural history in America, maybe the world. Hilary, you yeah. speak about the glass house as American. What is American about it? Well, uh, kind of to follow up some of the things that I was noting earlier, uh, the way in which, even though it doesn't seem that apparent, that it owes a debt to the ideas of Frank Wade Wright in terms of the integration of architecture within the landscape. And also, I'm so glad you brought it up, Carl, because Johnson was so emphatic about the fact that the house had to be really situated on the ground. Right. That, and, and like a Frank Wade Wright structure, but again, looking quite different, the importance of the hearth. Of, it's such a central element. As Johnson would say, this is southern New England. Uh, now, there's lots of aspects of the way he treated the landscape, which makes it a little bit like a circa um, uh, 1800 uh, royal park. Those three houses marked high points. Well, Paul Rudolph would then go to his less successful brutalism. Do you agree with me, Carl? Uh, in Rudolph's early work, certainly the Walker Guest House is a high, high point. And it's er very early. I mean, it's one of his first projects. It was actually done when he, before he'd opened his own office. It was Twitchell and Rudolph. It's a very high point. But Rudolph had a lot of high points. What is the value of the Walker Guest House once it's removed from its place? Rudolph's building, it is not on the water. It is not a view of the water. It is a view of the, the dune growth and jungle, and it's in a small jungle. So the building could be easily relocated. It was brought over there in pieces by boat. Now they're bridges, so it would be much easier to move it. It's not that big, but it seems enormous when you get the flaps and you get these outriggers all around the building. So it's a movable building. Johnson, as I said earlier, he used to say, you cannot not know history. And he felt that way even when he built the glass house itself. He said, my goodness, it's a 1920s house. It was already a reference to history when I built it in 1949. Johnson, who was never, sure, um, never slow in terms of coming up with a proper uh, line or a bon mot, uh, his response would be, the, next, the best project is the next one. I want to talk about politics. Mies was not very political. I mean, obviously, he designed that memorial for communist activists in the 20s. This was torn down by the Nazis. But then he tried to get jobs from the Nazis. And uh, famously or infamously, uh, he designed the German pavilion at the 1935 Brussels World's Fair, which eventually was not built because of financial limitations. But Philip Johnson was more active in his politics. And we know that he regretted it later on. And in fact, there is a synagogue that he designed in Port Chester, New York, which he designed for free for the Jewish people to overcome what he did. Is this something that you address? We're hardly in denial of the fact that Johnson's history is a complicated one. I'll just be polite about that. There's no question that it's highly troubling that Johnson's uh, career in architecture uh, has this strange break in the late 1930s where Johnson is uh, much more committed to uh, fascist politics and is, a, is, uh, is openly a supporter of uh, the Nazis. Uh, this is uh, something that one can never live down. There's no question about it. But Johnson unquestionably 
did not maintain that viewpoint for the rest of his life. If he had, I have, I'm fairly confident he would not have had the clientele that he did. I mean, for example, we showed the Seagram building built by the Bronfman family. Um, his background was well known. Uh, certainly more discussed these days, but it also was known in the 1940s, uh, 1950s. Uh, Johnson served in the U.S. military from 1943 to 45, and he took a lot of heat for his known political viewpoints. Uh, that said, I, did I discuss this with him? I did. I discussed it with him to have a better understanding of how someone this intelligent could have gone in this direction politically. And the best explanation or uh, I guess explanation is maybe the right term to use. It's not an excuse, uh, but explanation from him was that in those days, the, at the height of the Depression, uh, there was a desire among intellectuals for better solutions uh, politically uh, that in what was being than what was being um, uh, supported in uh, in contemporary in the contemporary world in terms of contemporary capitalism, and therefore many people either went far left or they went far right. Now today, I think we look very much askance at either choice, but unquestionably going far right seems appalling. So I would like to conclude here and to thank you for being here in this rainy day and to thank our panel, Hilary Lewis, <laughs> Carl Abbott, Scott Mahaffey.